Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the National Academy of Sciences and to our ASER program, the DC Art Science Evening Rendezvous. I'm J.D. Tulosic. I'm the Director of Cultural Programs here. Um, DASER, DC Art Science Evening Rendezvous, is an ongoing series of discussions presented with the intent of fostering cross-disciplinary dialogue, as well as providing creative practitioners in all fields an opportunity to network. DASERs are organized under the network umbrella of the Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous a Network, which fo has fostered over 50 similar events around the world, including Canada to Brazil and California to Moscow. So we are part of an ever-growing conversation um, that are, that's interested in, in practitioners who are interested in fostering these types of, uh, of, of cross-disciplinary collaborations across domains of knowledge. And tonight's program is also presented in collaboration with Issues in Science and Technology. Uh, and I see that many of you have picked up uh, a copy. Uh, the exhibit, uh, Blue Dreams, is on the cover, and uh, there's an article in there as well. Um, so let me ask, who, who here has been to a Dazer before? So several, several of you have. Welcome back. Uh, welcome to those um, who are new. Um, for those of you who have been here before, you, you're aware that typically at the very beginning we have what's called a community share, where anyone in the audience is able to come to the, to the microphone. Uh, we're going to have our discussion first, and then we're going to do the community share at the end with the idea that that will lead us into the reception so everybody's name will be fresh on your mind. So, th so keep that in mind. Towards the end, if you want to introduce yourself, a collaborative uh, project that you're working on, or if you're looking for collaborators, um, this would be a time to come to the microphone and share. Um, tonight's Dazer is organized around the, cor the current exhibit that we have in the upstairs gallery called Blue Dreams and the collaborative that helped create it called the Ocean Memory Project. And I'd like to thank many of the people who contributed uh, to the exhibit um, in reality, and especially I would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Schmidt Ocean Institute. And also, I think there's a couple of people that we need to acknowledge in the audience. Uh, Heather Spence is the co-PI of Ocean Memory Project. Is Heather, Heather's back over here. Many of you who have been to the Dazer know her as a Dazer alum. Uh, we're glad you're here, welcome. And uh, is Drew here? Okay, Drew didn't make it. Drew is the technician that helped us with uh, the, the video install. So we'll hear more about the Blue Dream exhibit and the Ocean Memory Project as the discussion unfolds. Uh, but let me uh, introduce you uh, to our distinguished panel uh, who are all part of the Blue Dream team. I've been waiting for a year to say that, the Blue Dream team. Uh, presenting uh, first is, is uh, artist Rebecca Rutstein, who is sitting here uh, in the center. Uh, who for over 20 years has created paintings, sculptures, interactives, installations, and public art inspired by the natural world. And tonight we will hear more about her career and her work as it has led up to her working with the Ocean Memory Project. Then we'll also hear from Samantha Joy, who uh, her friends call Mandy. Um, Samantha is a, a oceanographer, an educator, and a vocal ocean and environmental advocate. Samantha is uh, an expert in microbiology and biogeochemistry and works in extreme deep ocean environments. Um, and I'm also very excited to introduce Tom Scalick because we've been doing the Dazers for 13 years and Tom Scalick was on the very first panel 13 years ago. So welcome back, Tom. We're so glad to have you here again. Um, and uh, Tom is a science strategist a biomedical engineer, writer, and an artist. Uh, Tom is uh, Vice President for Research Emeritus at the University of Virginia. Uh, and we are also joined online uh, by Jody Deming. And Jody is the co-PI with Heather uh, Spence for the Ocean Memory Project, a project that was funded by the National Academy's Keck Futures Initiative. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and an oceanographer whose research focuses on the bacteria viruses, 
and other microorganisms as sub-zero salt water within the polar sea ice. So welcome, let's just take a moment to welcome our panelists. Uh, uh, And Rebecca, we're going to turn it over to you. Can you kick us off, please? Thank you so much, J.D., for the kind introduction. Um, as he mentioned, I am a multidisciplinary artist, and for over 20 years, I've been creating work inspired by the natural world. Um, and while my practice has been primarily uh, focused on painting, it has evolved into other mediums, including sculpture, interactive installation, immersive video, like the Blue Dreams Project, sound installation, and public art. The element I think that really weaves together all of my practice is um, the desire to shed light on hidden systems in the natural world um, and to make the invisible visible through the medium of art. Delving into public art over the last decade has really transformed my practice in terms of thinking about the kind of scale I would like to achieve with my work and also thinking about the kind of access I want my work to have, um, getting it out of the gallery setting and into a public space where many more people can interact with it. But I think the real breakthrough for me and the sort of transcendent experience um, of my journey has been collaborating with scientists on research vessels at sea and going down in a submersible and seeing the ocean floor and this incredible world with my own eyes. Um, it's an experience that really changes you as a person. And um, I say transcendent because it really kind of changed my perspective on the world um, and it changed my relationship with the natural world. It really affected um, the trajectory of my artistic practice and has really shifted my purpose. Um, I feel really passionately about creating visual and immersive experiences that can shed light on places and processes that are often hidden from view to connect people more deeply with the natural world um, in the face of our changing climate. Um, and I think often of Jacques Cousteau's famous quote, you only protect what you love. And so for me, I'm trying to create experiences that generate empathy, um, that create a sense of awe and wonder um, for the natural world um, to hopefully push for stewardship of our oceans and um, our planet. For me, decades of being interested in geology, which led to an interest in the ocean, um, plus um, an incredibly encouraging and supportive partner culminated in the summer of 2015, which led me on a research vessel for the first time, sailing for three weeks um, from the Galapagos to California. And I got on the ship and I never looked back. Um, again, it was a really transformative experience. We were mapping the ocean floor um, with multi-beam sonar technology attached to the hull of the ship. I was painting on the ship, setting up a makeshift studio, and while we were trailing a hurricane in the South Pacific. I took that data and brought it into a 40 modeling program so I could visually kind of move through this hidden terrain. And then I would take and incorporate those um, mappings into my paintings that I created on the ship um, and, and back in my Philadelphia studio. It wasn't long before I got back out to sea. Um, I just had really loved the experiences of working with scientists and exploring the unknown. Uh, in 2016, I was in Tahiti, and then I sailed from Vietnam to Guam on the Fall Corps. Um, and Schmidt has been an amazing sponsor of this project, as JD mentioned. Um, there, I set up a makeshift studio, and I was working with satellite data of the Mekong River as it flows into the South China Sea and looking at chlorophyll concentrations and that sort of transition between fresh water to salt water. As I became more entrenched in the oceanographic community through these expeditions, I was invited into the Ocean Memory Project, which was just forming. Um, this was in 2017, and the Ocean Memory Project is, is a really amazing group. It's a, it's a transdisciplinary group of artists, scientists, and people in the humanities who are coming together to look at the ocean in novel ways and framing it through the lens of memory. 
And so for me, I think about it as sort of thinking about the ocean as an, uh, the ocean and its inhabitants as sort of a, a living interconnected system that has agency and memory and um, through environmental changes, um, they can be recorded through different mechanisms within the ocean. Um, being part of this project has really been transformative for me and um, I am so grateful to be you know, working with the people that I met through this project and we'll talk more about the Ocean Memory Project. But shortly after um, joining the Ocean Memory Project, I was invited by um, a former colleague um, to go down in the submersible Alvin for the first time, which was a real dream come true in 2018. We were um, sailing off the coast of Costa Rica and we were um, looking at methane seeps that were caused by these seamounts subducting underneath the Costa Rican plate and looking at the spheres of influence that happen around methane seeps and thinking about um, these, these ecosystems that are, that are subsisting on chemicals. A few weeks later, I was back out there with Mandy Joy sitting here. Mandy and I met at the Ocean Memory Project. Um, as soon as we met, I knew um, we, there was a synergy there between her passion for what she does and, and for the way I am passionate about my work. And um, I, I knew that I wanted to collaborate with her. It's been an incredible um, relationship. And um, when we met and I was talking to her about my dream to go on Alvin, she simply said, I'll take you. And so um, next thing you know, in 2018, we're back out there off the coast of uh, Mexico. I won't get into too much of the geo geologic processes there, I'll let Mandy talk about it, but um, we were um, exploring hydrothermal vent systems, um, looking at really ancient processes that are happening right now um, um, in the Guaymas Basin. Working on um, a ship with scientists and collaborating together um, is, there is a power in that collaboration. Um, people bringing together different perspectives and different areas of research and coming together and being embedded together um, and, and influencing one another and being inspired by one another. Um, I think of it as sort of an emergent kind of process in, in which really the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Um, I, what I created was deeply impacted by their work and I believe that artists working with scientists has an influence on what they're doing. And um, I think that this is just an incredible opportunity to um, bring people out of their silos and work together. Again, Mandy and I had the opportunity to go down in Alvin. It was an incredible experience. I would say a spiritual one. Um, going down, not only seeing this, this otherworldly space um, that live in extremes, um, where organisms are living at extremes, but also the, the experience of going down the water column and descending in the dark and seeing bioluminescent lights all around you. It really changes you as a person um, and it's, it's really impacted me and um, it's something I've been exploring in my work. Mandy's gonna share a lot of amazing video but this is just a glimpse of some of the incredible life that we were seeing there. Bacterial mats that's, that subsist on um, hydrogen sulfide. Riftia two worms that are living off of the bacteria. The bacteria form the foundation of this incredible ecosystem. Looking closer at the bacterial mats, you see these really open architectural structures to maximize the flow of oxygen and hydrogen sulfide. And then looking even closer, you can see um, these filaments. Um, and I wanted to sort of amplify these, these microscopic worlds, these networks, and so I created very large scale paintings um, that were working with these sort of hidden architectures. Another outcome of our collaboration was the shimmer installation at the Georgia Museum of Art, which is um, looking at um, hydro, it's inspired by hydrocarbon structures that make up oil that's forming in this location, which Mandy will talk more about, but also um, thinking about um, the bioluminescent life that I saw going down the water column, the saphonophore is an organism with tra that sends trails of light down tentacles, and so I mimicked the saphonophore in LED lights um, that react when a viewer approaches the piece. This was an ocean memory project cruise that I did with Jody Deming and some other members of the project. And we were looking at transitions and gradients in the Salish Sea, um, looking at the deep salty waters of the Pacific upwelling into the fresh waters of the Salish Sea. 
and thinking about memory in the terms of microbes that can survive from one location to another and how they must be adapting and encoding to make that transition. Also looking at um, structures like diatom structures in the water column and again painting about all of these webs of interactivity that are happening um, in the deep sea. Um, this most recent expedition on the Kila Moana in January of 2023 um, was off the coast of Hawaii. Um, it was at the Kamehu Kanaloa uh, submarine volcano. And there we were looking at, again, another chemosynthetic ecosystem where iron oxidizing bacteria are surviving off of dissolved iron that's coming out of a salt rock. Seeing these kind of ecosystems is is it's really an analog for thinking about life on other planets, and it's really exciting to be in the control van and seeing this world through the eyes of the ROV. Again, I always set up a studio on the ship painting about the data that's being collected, and in particular here, I was looking at, again, this sort of intricate network of microbes. These iron oxidizing microbes actually form these incredible mineral deposits to create these, these structures. A few, a several um, ongoing collaborations I just wanted to share very briefly. The Immersion Project, this has been going on for about five years. It's a, um, a traveling art exhibition that will eventually be an artificial reef in the deep sea. Um, it is um, a project that's hopefully coming to fruition this year, and um, it is part of remediation efforts from um, the beefy oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and trying to help um, restore those ecosystems. I'm also involved in a hydrothermal plume uh, collaboration where we're looking at how um, elements like iron dissipate thousands of miles from their source at hydrothermal vents all the way up to the surface waters in the north and thinking about creating a, a sculptural installation that can share that, that journey. And lastly, I'm working with Jody Deming on, an, on another collaboration, looking at the um, hidden architecture of sea ice and um, thinking about these brine channels within the ice that host living microbes and, and how climate change is changing um, those structures and, um, and how they're being impacted. Finally, Mandy and I are going back to Glamis Basin in 2024. We're going back to the place um, where a lot of the footage was taken for Blue Dreams, including um, this image here, um, which is a mirrored flange, which, uh, again, Mandy can talk more about. But Blue Dreams um, is really a, a collaboration. Um, it, it's a true collaboration in the sense that it could not have happened without my collaborators. We really worked together. I, I gained insight and um, deeper understanding of geologic processes, of microbial networks in the deep sea, um, to me, um, it's very hard to imagine that we're connected to this place that's so far from us. Um, you, think about, you think about these microbial networks in the deep sea that are doing so much. You know, they are, they are you know, mediating global ocean chemistry. They're, they're mediating the air we breathe. They're mitigating climate change. And yet, it's so hard to imagine that we are, we are connected with this place. When you think about, um, you know, Sylvia Earle said, with every drop of water you drink, with every breath of air you take, you're connected back to the sea. And so for me, you know, when I, when I start to think about that, that connection, that not only are we connected, but we are relying on these microbes for our own survival. Um, it's really important for me to collaborate with scientists to help share and, and raise awareness um, of the wonders of the natural world as we face the global challenges that we do. Thank you, Rebecca. So I'm going to share with you um, some of my favorite uh, imagery from the Gulf of California. And it's, it's hard to articulate and to, to properly explain to people you know, my students and my kids and my friends ask me, well, what do you see when you, when you go on these dives? What we see is, is 
wondrous features like this mirror flange here that I, I think when we were out on the Falkor on this particular expedition, I went up and down that flange about 50 times um, before I decided that we had spent an hour and a half and that was probably enough. But these features and the organisms that live there, as Rebecca mentioned before, they really, these organisms drive geochemical cycles on Earth and they make the planet habitable. I think of these little mighty microorganisms as, as engines. They're geobiological engines that make Earth a habitable planet. And the processes and the organisms that we study have been doing this for billions of years. Some places it's really hard to study these processes because the organisms aren't so abundant and the rates that they metabolize are pretty low and you can't really assess their importance. But in the deep sea, everything is accelerated, especially around these hydrothermal vents because there are incredibly robust sources of energy in these hydrothermal fluids, uh, reduce chemicals that provide these microorganisms that are essentially using chemical energy to fix carbon the same way that photosynthetic organisms uh, fix, fix carbon in, in the photic zone. I've had the good fortune of working in the Gulf of California for, for 18 years. And I've been on, I think we've had seven expeditions out there and every single one is new and different. We discovered on the, the cruise that Rebecca was on, um, these incredibly enormous hydrothermal edifices that seven years before had been little meters high towers that were then 18 to 20 meters tall. And when we went back in that was in November of 2018, we'll move it back in February of 2019 with the Falcor, they were 28 to 30 meters tall. They had grown tens of meters in less than three months. And that's just because things can happen in incredibly fast intervals. Things are accelerated in the deep sea. And that's why it's, it's interesting and easy to, to explore these habitats. Rebecca mentioned a love for geology. I, I share that um, fascination with geology. I was two, cl two classes short of having a triple major in biology, chemistry, and geology. Um, couldn't quite get those extra two geology classes in my schedule. Um, but, but in the deep sea and in many ecosystems, they're not just rocks. They're actually living ecosystems. They're, they're endolithic organisms that live in these rocks and that metabolize in these rocks and they carry out processes that make the rocks grow and make the rocks harder and more sturdy. What you're seeing here is a flange field. This, this video is gonna loop um, and I'm gonna talk through it twice, but this flange field as these, the, to, to give you a sense of scale, this feature is about 12 meters tall and about 20 meters in diameter. This flange is nine meters across and a meter and a half um, tall. The, 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 the thing you're looking under is a meter and a half tall. So these are pretty enormous um, structures and the fluids coming out of here, this is, this is the flange that's in Blue Dreams, the fluids coming out of there are 375 degrees centigrade. Um, they don't boil because it's at 2200 meters water depth, so the high pressure, um, they're, not boiling, they're not boiling down there, but they're superheated. And the organisms, if you, if you look at this particular montage, there are polychaete worms living anywhere from a foot to 18 inches from these incredibly superheated fluids. So the temperature gradients in these structures are just immense. You've got 400 degree fluids over here and two degree background water, you know, not far away. But the, the rocks um, and the organisms that live in, in and on these rocks are the organisms that, that we study. We're studying really ancient processes and the organisms that we're studying are some of the most ancient on Earth. In fact, the Guaymas Basin in the Gulf of California was one of the first places where Asgard archaeota um, were found to be widespread and, and very, very abundant. These Asgard archaeota, which most of you probably have never heard of, um, turn out to be really closely related to eukaryotes. And they have a lot of um, similar biochemical features um, to eukaryotic organisms that prokaryotic microorganisms were supposed to have, but the Asgards, they have them and they're incredibly ancient and, it, and they could end up being the earliest relative of, of eukaryotes and 
we find them in a system like Guaymas Basin. They, they turn out to be about 20% of the, the microbial biomass or these, these strange Asgard archaeota. We found a lot of really strange organisms that do a lot of really strange metabolisms in the system. As Rebecca mentioned, there are hydrocarbons in the Guaymas Basin. The Gulf of California is a young ocean basin, so it's being formed by the splitting apart of the Pacific Plate and the North American plate. So you have hydrothermal fluids and crust that's being produced and it's spreading out. So the system is, is opening up sort of like the Red Sea. But unlike the Red Sea, there are seven rivers feeding the Gulf of California. So the sediment package um, overlying these hydrothermal sills is about 400 meters thick. So you have this hydro hydrothermal heating that's basically thermocatalytically cracking the organic matter, creating oil. The oil, if you date it, Unlike the oil in the Gulf of Mexico, which is Jurassic in age, about 80 million years old, the oil in the Gulf of California is less than 5,000 year years old. So it's, it's fresh, being formed in real time, and it offers us an opportunity to study the microorganisms that feast upon these, this rich um, platter of organic matter uh, in real time before that oil's had a chance to be very degraded. So I've been working in, in these sorts of systems for a long time, and I've been collaborating with artists, um, with Rebecca now for five years. We're about to do our second expedition together. But I've been working with artists um, for, for quite some time because I find that it, you know, I'm a scientist, I can communicate with scientists, I can communicate with the public reasonably well, but I find that sharing my science through works of art touches a nerve and reaches people in a very different way that's so incredibly powerful. And that's why I really enjoy working with artists like Rebecca, um, because it gets the message to a different audience, it gets the message to the audience in a much more effective way, and it elicits empathy and caring about the system, which I think is, is really critically important. You don't. You don't really, you're not motivated to save things if you don't care about them. And, and the ocean is under a lot of stress. You know, these deep sea habitats, you know, I'm showing you beautiful imagery, um, but there are places in the Gulf of California, topographic lows, where it is just a big giant trash heap. Tons of plastic, Christmas trees. Um, when we were on the Falcor, we were there in, in February, and we saw Christmas trees and balloons and Christmas decorations that had just washed into the system over the holidays and ended up on the bottom of the ocean. Um, we found a whole school of squid um, that were dead on the bottom of the ocean that had gotten caught up in, big giant squid that had gotten caught up in a fishing net. And, you know, you don't realize you, this is a beautiful system but it is, it is impacted just like every other ocean system is. So it's really critically important that we do everything we can to raise awareness and compassion about the ocean because sustaining and, and maintaining the ecosystem services that the ocean provides is not important just for the ocean, it's important for each one of us. Tom? Thank you. I'd like to um, talk a little bit about art and science. And um, you've just heard um, some perspectives on both of those. But to start with, you can think about um, the entire history of art, on, on the one hand, as being a gesture of hope. And on the other hand, you can also think about the urge, the human urge, to explore and discover new knowledge through science or advanced society through other professions like engineering, medicine, and related endeavors as being about hope as well. So both are really about hope in, in the long run. And Blue Dreams, um, as an art science project dealing with ocean ecosystems, um, is also a gesture of hope, really. It's, it's sort of, um, we felt that it's sort of a statement that we exist, and we exist, as Rebecca said, in close synergy with these complex ecosystems, 
of, of the ocean. So the gesture of hope in Blue Dreams is, is one way that um, science and art are actually brought closer together, even um, intertwined than, than you would normally think of science and art being. Um, in terms of some historical perspective on this intertwining, Mark Rothko, the American painter, about 80 years ago in 1941, before he painted his, his uh, floating color fields um, work that most people are very familiar with and in love with in general um, in the art world, um, he, he said that the Renaissance artist dreamed of being all in one. And, and what he meant was being all in one, priest or priestess, um, scientist and artist, all, all in one. And so in a way, I think about this Blue Dreams project and collaboration as being of that, of that ilk in a way for the modern world, because in a way we set out on an unachievable aim when we, when we started this off you know, to portray all of the complexity of an ocean, even one part of the ocean ecosystem, you could argue was even unachievable. So in a way, um, it's not surprising, or you could say we, could, we couldn't avoid creating something like this by bringing together art and, and science and technology all, all in, into the piece. Um, in the essay for the catalog, of Blue Dreams, which you can see online. Um, I began by referring to this work of art by Albrecht Dürer, which is from um, 500 years ago. So half a millennia ago, and he, this is a master engraving, uh, Melancholia I, by probably the greatest engraver ever, um, even though it was 500 years ago. And what you can see is that he was wrestling in his own times with, in a way, the same um, critical, urgent issues that Rebecca and Mandy were, were just um, voicing, in that he was wrestling with the spiritualism and the, uh, and the world of the imagination in the art world, but the spiritualism, because it was dominant in Europe at that time, as a, in a dichotomy really with the emerging secular world, which you can see elements of in the engraving that involve things like new ways of trade, new crafts, new ways of making pigment in, in art, um, new, uh, new ways of commerce, mathematics, physics, and, and so on. And he, he was trying to um, link these worlds together. And then if we come further to the present, um, this is a work by the American artist uh, Doug Aitken from Los Angeles, um, who created this amazing monumental scale work of moving images combined with sound, which is what Blue Dreams has done. And it in part inspired the form, the final form of the Blue Dreams work. So we, we looked at this piece early on. And in fact, I, I was lucky to attend this, JD did, probably some of you in this Washington audience were able to experience this work um, a few years ago on the facade of the Hirshhorn um, here in DC on the mall. And um, what, what Doug was doing with this piece was in a way the same thing for the modern world that Durer was doing 500 years ago in that it, you really felt when you immersed yourself, this also was kind of an immersion piece that you could walk around and be immersed in. It expressed a sort of tension between the, the human spirit grappling with the technology that now surrounds us all. And anyone who's looked at their smartphone lately and gotten an AI response and so forth, I think you probably know what, I, what I'm talking about and, and what Doug was trying to express using this monumental um, art, art form. So th this partly inspired the, um, the, the experiential display that you'll see in the Blue Dreams um, work. Um, scientists and artists, just to continue on this theme of science and art, you know, they explore at boundaries. And actually, I want to express that probably everyone in this room, because there are unique lived experiences that are unique to every individual, 
and probably by your choice to be here tonight, you've, you are exploring at boundaries of human knowledge. I mean, we all do that in our lived experience. And when you're exploring at a boundary, which clearly Rebecca and Mandy do when they do a deep dive, for example, in, in ocean science, but actually many of us do in other walks. And when you're at a boundary, you're at an edge. You're moving along an edge. And if you're at an edge, you can fall off. And if you fall off the edge, you may look down into the abyss or into the deep sea, if you're an ocean explorer, or up at the skies. And in, in either case, you, you may experience that sort of profound awe or that tinged with wonder or curiosity that, again, that Rebecca was talking about. And I think having once experienced that, that sense of awe and wonder in the world, in your edge or your boundary, um, you, you can find some peace. And so, because in a way, it's, it's a way, and this is what art can do in general, it's a way of reducing the gap between the subconscious and the conscious. You know, it brings those two together as a, in, in the way it can express um, the feelings. And that, just as Durer did, as he was trying to reconcile the secular world with the spiritual world in his day, and as Doug Aitken did, and we, th we hope that as you experience blue dreams, you may find um, some peace as well. And the, finally, I just want to say, it, and Mandy already said this, but Rebecca, it's such a pleasure to work with you. And you know, working with an artist like Rebecca for an art science collaboration is really a, a rare experience. And I, and I just want to say, anyone in the, in the audience, if you're with a big organization or you're an individual, and you're looking for someone to do an art science collaboration, Rebecca is really um, a rare person to, to do that. I, I don't, I mean, I've worked with a lot of people in the art world, and it's kind of a rare um, quality to be able to cross those boundaries, I think. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Can I say one other thing? Well, thank you, JD. And one other comment. I also wanted to thank JD before I finish, if I may, because we felt that to um, realize the work in the form you'll see in the upstairs gallery tonight, um, JD actually was critical in this. So I, I think we'd be remiss as a team if we didn't say thanks to JD. And we actually consider JD to be one of our co-creators because the work originally was imagined like the Aitken work you see here, kind of in a monumental experiential sh format. And it's because JD saw the potential um, for impact that that would have on audiences that it actually ended up in the envisioned form. So JD is actually one of the co-creators of Blue Dreams, not, not the moderator of this session. And so we really want to thank you um, for doing that. So I'm speechless. I don't know what to say. I'm usually not in that position as the moderator. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, we're going to turn this over to uh, Jody, who is joining us from Seattle. Um, hopefully our sound is working. Jody, can you hear us? Yes. Give me just a second. Uh, good. Thank you. thank you. And thank you to everyone who's just spoken so eloquently about this exploration at boundaries and edges. It's so important and exciting. This is our ocean, our four billion year old ocean. It defines our planet Earth. Despite all the wonderful discoveries being made about exoplanets elsewhere, our ocean still makes us very unique in the universe. From our ocean emerged life. Our ocean has nurtured ecosystems throughout the eons, and today it is sustaining the ecosystem that we seem so intent on changing. So the ocean defines the earth. Its memories must be boundless. This is a representation of memory. These are neurons in the mammalian brain uh, that are involved in making memory. And this is what we're most familiar with when we think about memory. But in fact, every class of organisms that has been studied for memory contains a mechanism for 
making memory, encoding information, pruning it, keeping what it needs to be more fit in the future as conditions change. That's the definition of memory. I would argue that memory is uh, essential to life because all life as we know it carries memory. Even the very smallest of organisms, microorganisms that have no possibility for neuronals, synapses, or for brains, they encode memory in their DNA. And there are specific memory mechanisms that we know about from their DNA. So what happens if you put ocean and memory together? You've already heard about the Ocean Memory Project. I'm just here to tell you a little bit more about it. When you put those two words together, then you're lucky enough to get funded by the National Academy Keck Futures Initiatives. And we have what's called the Ocean Memory Project, which is all about exploring those boundaries, those edges that Tom just mentioned. And we are a group of uh, individuals from every imaginable creative practice. We started as scientists and artists, but we have certainly expanded. And ocean memory means something different to each person. Each person who comes to those two words put together brings a different perspective. For example, a molecular biologist might think of it, think of ocean memory as the way that DNA and gene expression patterns record what's happened in the ocean over time. An artist, a weaver, might consider instead what ocean memories mean in terms of form and volume, more in the artistic speak, if you will. A writer, uh, a um, professor of writing, might think of it entirely differently. How does the ocean hold its trauma? How does ocean memory work in that regard? And we have Rebecca as our prime example today who thinks about microorganisms as a network of memory agents when she thinks of ocean memory. I believe this is Mandy and me as well. We're all microbiologists. Uh, but when I think of ocean memory, I think about what I study, which is sea ice. And we have lost an enormous amount of sea ice over the recent decades on this planet, this blue planet of ours. And that sea ice is filled with memory agents. Every cubic millimeter of it has some microorganism in it doing some work for us. And so we are losing not only the ice, which has enormous implications for climate and for the larger organisms that live in this kind of environment, but also for the biogeochemical cycles of the planet that Mandy and Rebecca have both mentioned. Are we losing those memories? those memory agents in the ice, or are they being returned to the ocean and know because of the memory they carry of past oceans how to behave in the new ocean that we're forcing on our planet? So I'm going to do a little metaphorical visual trick here and show you how art and science can come together, at least in my mind right now, and I'm referring to the project that Rebecca mentioned that we've just initiated thinking about memory in the architecture of sea ice. So these are the neurons that I showed you before that are involved in, in memory creation and loss. And flanking it now are false color images of two sea ice cores showing you the interior architecture of the ice. Sea ice is not solid ice, it's porous. And these channels in here are filled with liquid and they are the habitat for all the microorganisms that are doing a lot of work for us right now in the ice that covers the polar oceans. It is the blending and the exploring at these boundaries of art and science that we get new inspiration and new intuition for the next scientific question to ask. And I could carry on here about how uh, in my own lab, we're going more deeply into the nanoscale memory agents that are present in these brines, but that's for another day. I just want to bring us back to the fact that this is our one ocean, our one planet, and we face a lot of important issues to decide. And as so many have already said, the more that we can bring people together to understand and respect the ocean, the more we can approach these problems uh, with passion.
which I believe is needed today. Thank you. Jody, thank you so much, and thank you for, for being here. Um, I, th there's a couple of, of directions that we could start this discussion uh, with, and because I'm thinking about how, how beautifully Tom said that um, the art and science is a, is a gesture of hope and this sort of idealistic relationship between them. <clears throat> but I, I, I also am very struck by just sort of the, the pragmatic need for this sort of relationship when I'm seeing Mandy and Rebecca um, basically doing their research together from very different methodologies and epistemologies, but still working side by side to sort of understand the same thing in different ways. And I, I wonder if we could start with that, that's sort of pragmatic. And in so many cases, you know, when we, we look at research and we look at funding for research, the relationship with an artist is there, but it's usually an add-on. It's like, this is how we are going to um, sort of communicate, and this is how we're going to, to share this, which is important and is definitely, a, you know, a, an opportunity to be of service. But what I'm seeing throughout this past year of working with all of you is that this relationship, when you go on these ships, when you go into these artist residencies, that relationship is more than just communication. That is really impacting research on both your sides. The scientists, I am assuming, and this is a question for you, you know, what, what insight have you, Mandy, as a scientist, received from artists that you've worked with? And, and also, Rebecca, for you, uh, what is, you know, what is that relationship? You, you, you touched on that a little bit more, where it's like, you know, your, your work is about the natural environment. And every time that you, you work with scientists, it informs that. Um, and I'll also ask Jody and Tom to kind of weigh in on this too from, from observations, but tell, tell us a little bit more of that sort of pragmatic relationship of, 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 you know, beyond science communication, but, you know, how does it impact research? How does it impact the way that you approach your work? It's a, it's a really important point because I remember on our dive, you looked out the porthole and you said, do you see that? And I was like, what are you talking about? And she saw something that I totally missed because of my implicit bias. I just didn't see it. And it turned out to be, it, it doesn't really matter what it was, but Rebecca, working with Rebecca has changed the way that I think and how I see things. And it, it's, it's altered my perspective. It's altered the way that I think I communicate science, that I approach science, to the point that in in a pending project that Rebecca's, a different project from Guaymas that Rebecca's also involved in, we're not just bringing professional artists on cruises, I'm engaging art students from UGA and music students from UGA and bringing them on the cruises with the professionals. And so we're not only gonna make ocean art, we're gonna make ocean music and we're gonna have a concert at the Hodgson School of Music with ocean music, ocean themed and ocean inspired music. And that's how you really touch a lot of people and every student that goes on those cruises is going to be changed and they're going to go and they're going to do their work throughout their life and that expedition the experience that they get that will change them forever because every expedition jody can attest to this every time we go out to sea we don't come back the same person we're changed we see different things we've learned different things but when you work in submersibles and you spend time at literally the bottom of the world you can't help but come back a different person. And you are, you're not only more passionate and more empathetic, but you're driven to do more, to, to save it all, and to sustain, to sustain it all. And I think that, I mean, it sounds a little corny, but it's absolutely true. Um, Rebecca? You know, it's hard to even put into words how, how profound an impact it's been working with scientists. I mean, I, I mentioned briefly in my talk that it really changed the whole the whole trajectory of my career, you know. It um, and that's not an understatement or an overstatement. Um, you know, it, starting to work with scientists, you know, I had been interested in the ocean. I had been interested in these sort of hidden terrains. I hadn't thought about microbes. That didn't even cross my mind until I started working with scientists. And and 
now it's kind of all I can think about. Um, I mean, it, it's a, a little crazy, but no, I mean, I, I, it, my whole perspective um, has changed. The way I, I understand how the natural world is interconnected. Um, and you know, I haven't talked about in this talk, but I have done collaborations with other scientists outside of the oceanographic you know, realm. And again, I am just captivated by all of the connections that I see within different systems, and so on different scales. And um, so yeah, I, I, to me, I, my whole world has changed. You know, my, my, the direction of my work, um, thinking about, you know, before I was sort of making paintings and kind of painting in a vacuum in a way. I was inspired by the natural world, but I was, you know, it was a very kind of isolated experience for me, and, and I was sharing the work. Starting to work with scientists um, has really changed the way I look at my work. Um, I'm trying to create something beyond an aesthetic experience. I'm trying to resonate beyond that into, you know, really thinking about these important issues. So um, I just also want to add that, you know, it seems like there's typically this dichotomy between art and science, and Tom's touching on the fact that, you know, there's a lot of similarities in that sense of hope. And so for me, like, I've been struck by how much, you know, scientists are creators, you know? I mean, they are, they are creators, and, um, you know, they're passionate about, um, you know, they're, they're interested in the world around them, just like an artist is, and trying to sort of understand the world around them. So. Um, I have two little anecdotes. I mean, one was, you know, Mandy and I talking about um, just describing our experience in the deep ocean. We were being interviewed for a magazine, and, and the writer couldn't decipher who was the artist and who was the scientist, the way we were talking. You know, it was just like both of us were just, you know, going crazy about what we were seeing. And then this has to do with Jody. Um, you know, Jody, uh, when I first met, Jody, um, one of the first workshops. Jody's been a huge inspiration to me, just a, an enormous inspiration to me. Um, but one of the first times I talked to her, I remember her telling me that she was a very accomplished pianist and um, decided to pursue science so that she could be more creative. And um, I was really struck by that because, um, you know, you would think that a musician would be more creative. But she felt like, and I hope I'm, it's okay, I'm speaking for you, Jody, but that she was playing other people's songs, where um, as a scientist, she could, she could, you know, devise her own experiments and design her own research inquiries, so, yeah. Sure. Just to add briefly, briefly, can I advance the slide one to, um, I think there's an image. Well, I just wanna, um, uh, yeah, this is an image from Blue Dreams that you'll see, and it's a sort of pixelated version of a painting that Rebecca did of the microbial maps. And, you know, my answer to JD's question about the pragmatic part of the, such a collaboration, I was not on the deep dive. I came into this project when we met as part of Ocean Memory, but we immediately sparked up this idea. But this came in later when uh, Shane Pierce Kotler, who's a bioengineer at the University of Virginia, who does this sort of single agent based modeling, but a very large complex systems came in to the team and worked with Rebecca on this. And what I wanna say is, as this got generated, you know, questions came from Rebecca, <laughs> the supposed artist, uh, you know, how does the green layer of, of cells, organisms, agents, whatever you wanna call them, you know, decide to move or grow or expand? Is it the temperature, like Mandy was talking? Is it the availability of nutrients? Is it the level of oxygen in the water? And so even after the dives were over and the imagery was available and Rebecca had applied her artistry to it, then there were new questions being asked that then drove the, uh, the, the dynamism, if you will, of the eventual work of art. So, I, and that's why I said also in the essay, which we then debated a lot in our team, is I said Rebecca is actually a scientist. And then she said, no, well within this work she's a scientist. But I think probably, I'm gonna argue, everyone in this audience would probably say you're a scientist listening to you speak. Because when I hear you speak about these complex networks and their dynamics, it sounds like I, you're in a, a PhD thesis defense in a university setting because there are questions being, there are new questions being posed that are being driven by the visual aesthetic 
and then there are responses sometimes that come back from the world of art that might inspire the new scientific question. So I, my, my answer is people in different walks of life truly can interact in a way that each becomes the other and, it, and that we should all really embrace these multiple aspects of the human experience. And that's why I'm, I'm very passionate about this art science um, collaboration that actually JD has been one of the leading proponents in the world of over many, a uh, couple decades now, because I think it's very fruitful. And I think um, we should just um, jump off the edge and immerse ourselves and just admit that we all wear different hats at different times. And to me, this really embodied it. When I saw this happening between Shane and Rebecca, I said, oh my God, now Shane is an artist and Rebecca's a scientist. And that, that's the pragmatic uh, fact that an artist always, you know, a masterpiece doesn't appear fully formed, you know, um, on, on the blank canvas. Artists solve problems and zigzag to the final embodiment of a vision. And scientists, when they appear in the lab in the morning, they do the same thing. They ask themselves a new question, they might face a new problem, and they zigzag to the eventual um, conclusion that they might reach in a given study. So I think, yeah, they have a lot in common in their working process. The word that I'm hearing come across all of these conversations is it's a shift in perspective because I heard Mandy say that very specifically, that the, art, the questions that somebody else's perspective made you see your work differently. And Jody, would you like to, to weigh in here? Because I, I know you've got some stories about this because I, I know some of these. I, I have too many stories for the time allotted, but I would just like to point out that uh, as scientists, we have something called the scientific method. and. We, we pose hypotheses, we invent tests of those hypotheses, we reject ideas, we get closer and closer to the truth as best we can understand a phenomenon. But there's an early stage here before we pose hypotheses where we make observations and we are sensitive to those observations. We let our intuition come into play as we're playing and thinking about and observing and being sensitive to observations. And it's at this stage of the scientific game where anybody, and it's maybe especially an artist because of the way that you've been trained to think and work in your practice, at that stage you can make observations and influence the scientific perspective before the hypothesis ever gets formed. And then the hypothesis can be different because of the input that you've made. So that's the stage I'm at right now with interacting with artists, with interacting with Rebecca, for example. Her work, um, as you may have noticed, involves a lot of fractal geometry. I don't know if you know what that means, but um, that means similarity in pattern at different scales. So you can have a similar pattern at a very large scale, but you can go to increasingly small scales or the other way around and find a similar pattern. My area of interest right now in sea ice has that uh, fractal geometry. Uh, at the kilometer scale, we see ice flows of a certain pattern, and we go down to the meter, centimeter, micrometer scale, and we see similar patterns. What, because Rebecca seems to focus in her artwork on fractal geometries, that really got me thinking more and more about fractal geometry in the, in the research I'm doing, um, and I wanted to go to zoom in even deeper to the nanometer scale. So now, because of Rebecca's way of doing her creative work, I'm now thinking about fractal geometry of DNA and the DNA that encodes memory, the me memory mechanisms that are available to DNA. If they increase the fractal geometry of it, they increase the ability to contain memory. So I, I shouldn't get too carried away here, but my point is that <laughs> Rebecca's form and uh, mode of creativity has directly influenced what my current graduate student is doing right now. Wonderful. That's one story. <laughs> Jody, one of, one of my favorite stories, and I may ask you to recount this, is it's actually the story of how Ocean Memory Project started. This shift in perspective uh, 
it was actually an artist at the National Academy of Tech Futures Initiative that brought up in a discussion something that changed the perspective the way that you thought about your long-term research and life. I wonder if I could impose on you to tell that story again, because it's one of my favorites. Yeah, well, we were, we were gathered together uh, 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 for a conference of people brought, bringing together uh, mostly medical and microbiology type scientists and artists and designers. And we divided up into rooms to focus in on the interface that we were assigned to think about and see what could come out creatively there. And the room I was in was kind of stuck. We, we weren't making much progress. We didn't know each other. It was a new experience to be together in that room, being forced to work at this boundary. It was kind of uh, uncomfortable. And at one point, an artist, Daniel Cohn is his name. He's also a co-PI on the Ocean Memory Project. He was at the whiteboard taking notes for us. And he just turned around to us and he said, well, does the ocean have memory? And I swear, I jumped off my seat. I was sitting on the, the wall of the room, just being quiet and listening to everybody struggle. And I jumped off my seat at that because I realized that everything I've been doing and thinking about for 45 years now has to do with the ocean carrying memory. I just didn't have those words for it. I hadn't used the word memory in any publication I'd ever written. And now that's the only way in which I seem to be able to think about processes and organisms and life in the ocean. So yeah, an artist uh, turned the tide there. Yeah, wonderful, Jody. Thank you for sharing that story. I, I want to invite members of the audience to come to one of the microphones that are on either side of the um, aisle uh, to ask a question. Also, yeah, thanks for turning the lights up. That way I can kind of see a little bit more. I, I do want, while we're lining up, I do want to ask this sort of question about, it's kind of going to what Tom was talking about, Rothko saying, uh, you know, becoming the one. And in the modern society, it's not about us becoming one, but it's actually about this sort of collaboration because there's a system of deep knowledge. There's educational systems that, that form silos. It's almost like this, this idea of collaboration is sort of the modernist ideal of becoming one. Um, but I also wonder about, and, and maybe we can incorporate this into some other, some other questions, but the question that I am asking myself a lot is, how, how does this change the way that we need to approach educational systems? How, because Rebecca, I came up as an artist, you know, like you did, and it's like I was taught in school you either gonna make work and sell it or you're going to teach. But this ideal that an artist could have roles within research, maybe roles within uh, planning committees for, for communities, you know, the ideal that we're taught that we can only do one thing and then people start saying, well, artists only do this, and it's not true. It's like what we do is so, so beyond that, but that's not the way that we're taught coming through. So unless we have like just a really brilliant you know, sort of uh, teacher. So maybe kind of, I'd like to kind of explore that at some point, but it seems like we have some eager people to ask questions and to uh, open up this discussion. And maybe we could start over on this side. Okay. Thank you, Dempsey. Uh, thank you, really enjoyed the program. I have a question, of course we're here in Washington, D.C., where a lot of policymakers and politicians do their work. And uh, you mentioned, I think it was Mandy in particular, sort of made an allusion to hoping that all these collaborations would help to change the way people think about the ocean and, and um, how we need to preserve it and um, how what the vital role that it plays in our lives. I'm just wondering whether on any of these collaborations you include uh, politicians, elected officials. That, that's a great question. Um, so there's, there's actually an event in Washington in June of every year called Chow. Has anybody heard of Chow? Capitol Hill Ocean Week. Um, and I, has anybody participated in Chow? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic opportunity to, to talk to politicians from your home state, from other states, about the science that you're doing. This is also the United Nations Ocean Decade between 2021 and 2030. And there's a, a global movement to sort of accelerate progress on 
ocean challenges. There are a lot of there are a number of challenges that the ocean decade is is addressing. As a sign, the National Academy of, of Sciences actually has UN Ocean Decade sanctioned programs, um, research programs that that they're advocating for. So there's there's a there's a lot of synergy, and I think a lot of oceanographers are are quite active in you know. I know that I talk to my politicians um, frequently and to others as well, and I think it's it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to do that because, you know, we see I've I've I work all over the world, not in, not just in the Gulf of California, and I, I worked on coral reefs for my master's thesis. And I've visited those same sites, you know, 20 years later, and there's there's nothing left of them. There's nothing like I remember. So I've I've seen the change. In, in you know, the 20 years I've been doing this as a professional scientist, I've seen dramatic levels of change that would blow most people's mind if they had the opportunity to see what I've seen. And it's incumbent upon me to, to share that with people and tell them, not to scare them, but to motivate them, to get activated, to get involved, and to do something to make the world a little bit of a better place. Because if each one of us do that, if everybody gets involved and commits to doing something that makes the world a better place, then we collectively are gonna be a whole lot better off. I'm glad to hear that. That makes a lot of sense. I was imagining uh, tearing a member of Congress away from his or her office long enough to go on one of the deep dives. It sounds like the deep dives are really transformative, and I would hope that maybe someone would have that opportunity. I've tried. I've actually tried to do that, and, and I've actually. I'm not even. I'm too embarrassed to to give you my craziest suggestion that I that I made. Um, I believe that the 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 response that I got that would be beyond the pale. Um, because I think diving in a submersible is, is a life-altering experience. And when the Alvin undergoes overhaul every five years, they have this science verification cruise. And they have tended to try and take um, somebody in the government out there, usually it's somebody from NOAA or the Navy. Um, but I think it would be really good to, you know, we have events that we do in ports when we're leaving on our cruises and in, in around the Gulf of Mexico from Tampa or Gulfport or New Orleans. We always invite local politicians and, and statewide elected officials and they always come. You know, I, I go to the state house and I talk to politicians about ocean related issues, even though we're not, you know, we have we, we don't have a, a Gulf Coast, but we have, you know, a little bit of an Atlantic coast. And there's a lot of buy in and it and it and it has an effect. But I think, you know, as scientists we're not taught to do that. We're not taught to, to you know, discuss things with politicians, um, but I think you know, scientists that work on the ocean and climate change in general, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of incentive these days to, to, to make our voices heard. Thank you. Let's go over here for a question. Uh, oh, okay. I think. So, can you all hear me? Yes. Cool, cool. Um, so I had a question for Rebecca. Uh, I was just curious, so I'm going to use the word translate here. It's not quite the right one, but I hope you'll get the gist. Um, I was curious about how you uh, translate science into art and what role like spirituality or transformative experiences or the sublime, whatever you want to call it, like plays into that. Um, I've played around with, you know, working directly with data into my work, um, you know, for instance, in incorporating the sort of multi-beam, you know, sonar, you know, bathymetry of the ocean floor into a painting, um, I'm sort of taking data in a somewhat direct way and bringing it into my work. Um, but a lot of, but even within those paintings, there is a, a very kind of emotive part of the process of those paintings, which is, um, I didn't get into, but when I was on that first trip out at sea, um, we were trailing a hurricane, as I mentioned, and so as a, as a means of responsiveness, I started pouring the paint onto the canvas because we were moving around so much that I couldn't really control the paint, and so I started letting the sort of, the movement of the ship kind of be recorded within the motion of the paint, and so I think there's always sort of, even if I'm working directly with data, there is a kind of a responsive kind of process that happens in, in the making of my work. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, exceptional artists that work with, you know, data related to climate change and they're making work that's really data driven. And I would say that the majority of my work is not that. Um, I have sonified data before for some sound work, but, um, 
I am really more interested in sort of uh, creating, um, I'm not trying to be didactic. Um, it's more about sort of creating a space um, for curiosity and, and sort of awe of the natural world. Um, and so I don't know if that's answering your question well or not, but. I, th I think this is an actually an interesting thing because you said your work's not didactic. It, it's it, about not it, always. It, not, it's, yeah. not, it's not always, but they're, they, they, you know, let's, let's take, for example, Blue Dreams. It's not meant to be didactic. We did not put up captions that said, now you're looking at this or this, you know, and there's, there's not that type of information. It's more of an experience. And it's more the idea, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that just for a second as it relates to that, that question. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, JD, because at, at one point, uh, you recall, we had the explicit discussion in the team about your question, whether in representing the dynamics, the motion, the different color objects in the, in the works that sh Rebecca had initially painted, and then we added movement to them, whether they should scientifically, mechanistically reflect the processes at work. And then we got Mandy, you know, in that, in that discussion, say, what is the exact response of this organism to this biochemical stimulus? And we purposely freed ourselves, we agreed as a group, that we would free ourselves of the need to be mechanistically accurate so that the artistry could take place, the magic could happen, if you will, so that the the, the inspirational aspect of the awe and wonder of the whole emergent system, I guess I'd say, could, could be free to emerge artistically, and it wouldn't need to be mechanistically accurate. And that would never be done in a pure scientific project, never. And, and vice versa, when people from the art world might view such a piece, they are sometimes, you know, drawn to the idea of wanting to gain more and more information, you know, as Rebecca does when she sets out to do the original painting. But I, I guess we feel that, that that would be sort of a, um, a misstep in terms of freeing yourself to immerse yourself in, in, in the aesthetic of the piece um, without the need to feel um, a mechanistic underpinning. Okay. Let, me, let me just check in. Jody, are you able to hear us? I know that there's a concern. You weren't able to hear the questions from the audience, but are you still able to hear the dialogue here? I, was not, I can hear the dialogue on stage, but I have not been able to hear the questions. Okay. So uh, we're, apparently we're, it's been fixed. But. Maybe we can either fix that or we can repeat the question for you. Um, I, I do want to like go back to just what Tom said for just a second. Um, the, when the Museum of Natural History first started having art exhibits within their space, they spent some time doing evaluations and they found out just that, that these art exhibits within their space were some of the lowest rated exhibits when it came to didactic information. Did you, when you entered this exhibition about oceanography, did you learn X, Y, and Z? No, you didn't. But questions about curiosity, questions about creating awe and wonder rated higher than any other exhibit they had ever had. So there is within the answer how these types of things can interact if we're trying to move things forward. If we're worried about didactic information, that's the, that's the way that this uh, is. So if you don't mind, let's go over to this question. It, just be sure to speak as closely into the microphone as possible and we'll try to make sure Jody can hear it. I just wanna make one short comment that this is just beautiful to hear the true collaboration between um, all of you and that you're in, um, impacting each other. But the question that I've got has to do with you are approaching this project from a complexity standpoint, systems, interactions, everything. And I've heard a few of you refer to different aspects of time and I'm wondering um, where you're part of this, like how you are looking at time, at the bias of, say, the investigator remembering from the beginning, the first time they saw the coral reef to now, versus what the coral reef looked like 100 years ago. And also our ability to interpret time, because we view it from our lifespan and our 
breathing process versus the, it, the really rapid work of the organisms in the ocean. And I'd just like to hear your comments on time. Comments on time, Jody. We're, we all have different perspectives. <laughs> Who would like to walk in through? So, I, I, strangely, I think about this all the time because there's this concept in ecology called the invisible present. And it was a bioscience paper that was written um, 35 years ago or so. And it's this concept of without knowledge of previous conditions or previous circumstances or previous ecological histories and, and, and dynamics, you're, you find yourself in this situation of looking around at this moment in time and thinking that this is normal, this is, this is what it is. And we all suffer from that because we, we have our memories of our life and maybe what our parents or grandparents told us. Um, but in terms of, of ecology, in terms of oceanography, you know, the kinds of measurements that we need to really understand how the system's gonna change in the future have only been possible, really, in the last, you know, two decades, maybe four decades, and we're getting better and better at it all the time. Um, so it is a really, it is, it is a really big problem, and, and, and that's one of the reasons I like working in the deep ocean is because it is like walking back in time. It's like walking back to what I imagine the Archean world used to look like, because in the Gulf of California, I didn't talk about this before, but it's a hypoxic, it's a low oxygen environment. There's only 20 micromolar oxygen in the bottom of the Gulf of California. That might not mean a lot, might not mean a lot to everybody, but in the surface of the ocean, there's around 300 micromolar oxygen. So it's, you know, much, much more oxygen than is in the bottom of the Guaymas Basin. And so it gives you sort of insight into what these low oxygen environments were like billions of years ago and the organisms that live there and the organisms that evolved. It also gives us a window into the future of what a low oxygen ocean is, is going to look like if we keep, you know, oxygen, ocean deoxygenation going. So I think about the perspective of time. I talk to my students about it and anybody that will listen all the time because this perspective and, 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 and realizing, just, just having the realization that what I am seeing is a snapshot of the system in its current state. This is not a healthy state. This is not fine. This is an altered state. And the recognition that it's an altered state then leads you to think about, well, what did it used to be like? Um, what was it like 100 years ago? What was it like 1,000 years ago? What was it like 10,000 years ago? And when you start doing, when you start going through that exercise, that's when you really begin to realize how much things have changed. Because things are just, you just, you can't even imagine it until you start making those jumps back in time and, and diving in and seeing what systems used to be like. That's when you really begin to realize how much damage the human race has done to this planet and how much work we have to do to get back to where we need to be. I would just add, if I may, that time is at the heart of memory. Yep. Memory is about the past that you bring forward to influence the future. So we can't deal with ocean memory without thinking about time. And the ocean holds memories over four billion years of time. So even if we don't have that in our heads, we can turn to the ocean to find information there that represents those memories. Yeah. I would just add, I think, you know, one of the really interesting aspects of the Ocean Memory Project is that um, we're looking at time, we're looking at vastly different time scales and, and memory that's happening in, in different time scales, you know, and, and so, you know, while we're looking at these really, you know, larger time scales, like, you know, thinking about chemosynthetic ecosystems and these sort of origins of life, you know, that we're still able to witness, you know, like in Guaymas Basin, you know, there's also this sort of more immediate time scale, you know, of, you know, where I'm learning about how microbes can can transfer genes almost in, you know, in real time. They can actually, you know, trade DNA in real time. And so, you know, another, like thinking about another type of time scale with the Ocean Memory Project is um, really thinking about the human lens of ocean memory. And we've been really, um, 
you know, interested in getting um, the native perspective of um, their relationship to the ocean and how that's changed. And so a lot of our workshops ha has involved um, that sort of human lens of um, ocean memory. Um, you know, another project that I mentioned very briefly um, that makes me think a lot about just really like vast geologic time scales is the project I'm doing with a scientist named Chris German uh, where we're looking at um, hydrothermal plumes and, and where these, you know, where these um, elements, where they're going, you know, after they come out of the deep ocean. And these are, this is like a process that's been happening since early ocean history. And there's iron coming out um, and uh, dissipating and, um, you know, dispersing for thousands of miles, um, as I mentioned, to the surface ocean. And what's amazing about that is to think of say, before we were in a high oxygen ocean environment, two billion years ago it was mostly iron. And so this is sort of a memory of that, um, the fact that iron is still needed for life, you know. Yeah, I, I wanted to add that I, my response to that question was that I felt great that this, I feel like Blue Dreams is now a fantastic success as we had imagined it at one time because by asking about time, it, it that's sort of the whole point of what JD was saying about a work of art that may be not didactic, but, but a source of inspiration because ideally it would lead each viewer that experiences it down their own path much. And what I thought of when you asked the question was it, it, my favorite still life in the National Gallery of Art, which is a bread and figs, you know, from the 16th century. And when you see that, well, the artist made a selection, just as Rebecca made a selection of the microbial maps and reduced them to a, a beautiful visual image. But there's a, a judgment made and a choice made. But that choice, although it's a snapshot in time, in the case of the still life, you might be thinking, wouldn't it be delightful to have an orchard, you know, with a breeze blowing through it with, where the figs could grow, or, or a wheat field, you know, blowing in the wind where the wheat can be harvested to make a delicious loaf of bread. And you go down all kinds of other human memories or human um, uh, in, in inspirations that could lead to possible futures. You know, we can go forward in time as well. So I. That's, that's my, that was my reaction. I said, it's a great question, and it's exactly what we're hoping to have happen in a work that can be a snapshot, but then it can inspire um, after immersion, and it can inspire you to go backward or forward in your own experience. Great responses, everyone. Let's move on to another question over on this side. A little bit awkward, but uh, thank you for the program. Um, as someone that's just starting their federal career at the EPA, I find it very inspiring that science and art can essentially combine together to tell stories of how environmental protection is absolutely important through different mediums. Um, my question to you is one theme that I've noticed just by listening to the Ocean Memory Project and the Blue Dreams exhibit is the fact that the science and arts are borderless. In my spare time, I run a newsletter for international embassy events here in DC. And one thing that noticed my curiosity was the Embassy of Italy had an art exhibit for GIS um, satellite image data of different like world heritage sites combined with environmental uh, preservation like aspects. I went to that exhibit last year, I believe, and I was curious with the Ocean Memory Project, are there any plans to work with different embassies here in DC to foster an international um, priority when it comes to environmental protection? Because I think that would be such an interesting avenue to explore. So, so the question is, are there um, plans to maybe work with embassies in the DC area uh, to explore these, these notions uh, from that perspective? Um. The Ocean Memory Project does not currently have such plans as far as I know, but as of this moment, we're going to start making them <laughs> for, that, for that idea. Excellent idea. I, I think it's a wonderful suggestion, especially those of us who work in D.C. realize the power of the embassies uh, to really create dialogues and um, Maybe, maybe we can have some more talks about that, Jody and everyone. 
there are some potential plans for this, um, you know, this particular exhibit to potentially exhibit elsewhere. And one of those places um, I'm hoping will be um, part of the, we mentioned the UN um, Decade of the Ocean, which is super important. It's happening right now through 2030. Um, their next uh, conference is in Barcelona in April of 2024. And so um, it's my hope that we can get this piece um, exhibited there and, um, you know, again, have it be part of the um, an endorsed UN Decade Ocean um, exhibit. So. Well, and it's, and, and it's, you just reminded me, and I didn't make this connection, so now we, we did collaborations with the Spanish Embassy a couple of years ago. So oh, that's we'll, great. We'll, we'll oh, okay. We'll talk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's so, and this ties into sort of, I think, um, someone else was asking about getting involved with government agencies. I mean, I think that there's really a, we're in a moment, you know, we're in a moment where I think people are realizing the importance of collaboration and interdisciplinary exchange. And so I think it's happening more and more. I mean, the Ocean Studies Board here at the Academy um, had their 100th meeting and Tom and I were invited to speak and talk about art science collaboration. You know, um, I'm working with um, NOAA on another, um, the, the, I mentioned it very briefly, it's called the Immersion Project, but um, NOAA is helping to, you know, disperse funding um, for restoration efforts um, in the Gulf of Mexico related to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And so they're, you know, I'm working directly with them um, to try to get this exhibit um, and, and deployment. So um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to involve. Yeah, well, I think, you know, a lot of times the embassies, they have their cultural attaches and they have the scientific uh, the, the visions and in a lot of ways what we're presenting here is an opportunity for them to work across their communities within within the embassies as well so I think it I think there's an openness to it thank you for the question let's go over here hello um, so earlier in the panel there was sort of a passing reference made to a difference in epistemology between um, Professor Joy and Professor Deming if you could, I would love to hear you elaborate on your personal epistemology, what that means to you, and how it informs your work. Jody, did you hear the question? I've heard the words. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. <laughs> can you rephrase it in a way that I can get it right away? Uh, sure. So what I was really sort of asking was how your personal um, scientific beliefs and your different ways of knowing as scientists inform your work both like in this project and more broadly as a whole. I think I alluded to this earlier that the stage in my science that's the most exciting part to me is being sensitive to observations and letting intuition come into play. And, and maybe this stems from what Rebecca referred to earlier, that the first part of my life I spent as a pianist and uh, making visual and audio observations of a lot of information coming at me and then how intuition works to generate ideas and the direction in which you want to head next. So I will confess that the intuitive process is very important to me. And I try to take in as many observations of as many different types as possible to inform that intuition. And this Ocean Memory Project and the opening up for me personally of merging science with art and the creative process that we both, we all go through that's been the, a very important part of it. So for me, I, I grew up on a farm. So if any of you have ever spent any time on a farm, you understand that you, you have an inherent appreciation for connectivity and, and how different things affect each other. And for, for me, that just sort of from, the, from the, my as far back as I can remember, I was just fascinated trying to figure out how things worked, whether that was how we could work without using gobs of fertilizer to make the soybean crop more productive, 
or how I could figure out how to, you know, fix the engine on a tractor. Um, you know, practical skills that you, you need to know, the engineering that comes in handy when you work on, you know, submersibles. Um, when I decided to come in a, become an oceanographer, which is a very convoluted story in and of itself, um, the ocean I fell in love with the first time I went there when I was four years old. And, and that sort of, this translation of trying to figure out how things work and how they're connected, um, that resonated with me when I started doing ocean science. And I've always been, you know, again, from the farming, the soil microbiome is critical. If you don't have a healthy soil microbiome, you don't have healthy crops. So understanding the microbial underpinnings of ecosystems is something that, although I didn't call it that at the time, that's what I was really passionate about understanding, and that's what I study now, how, the, how, how natural microbial ecosystems respond, respond to perturbation, whether that perturbation is a hydrothermal vent or temperature increases because of climate change, you know, it's, it's, it's a perturbation. And, you know, for me, that's sort of the singular thread to my career is, is understanding how systems, um, microbial systems rep respond to perturbations. And in the past, um, 15 years or so, I've been really interested in how perturbations propagate through ecosystems across how the changes in the microbial community, you know, how does that impact the whales, for example, because it's all connected. So, you know, for me, <clears throat> it's, you know, it starts with the little microbes because they're the most important thing. Um, and, you know, m most of our experience with microbes as humans is with pathogens, you know, and we're taught to, you know, de you know, put alcohol in your hands and sanitize and sanitize and this and the other. And I think one of the things, my favorite parts of working with Rebecca is that, you know, we're bringing these microbial networks that make the planet habitable to light, a different kind. You know, those are the microbes that are predominantly the ones that are, you know, the 99%. The, the um, and those are the ones that really matter, but those are the ones people don't think about. And those are the ones people should think about, so. We have time for two more quick questions, so let's go over here. Okay, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but could you all, everybody in the room, put the A back in STEM for art? Because it's just not enough to have STEM. We need art. I'm, I work on cells and art, and I can only tell you how, when you were talking, Mandy, about learning how Rebecca sees, when I talk to scientists about cells, I ask them, for adjectives, and they don't always give me adjectives, they give me nouns. <laughs> and so, you know, is it blobby? Is it green? Is it, what color green is it? Those kinds of things. So I think that's really, really important. And there's, there's a lot of talk about STEM, which I think is great, but I really wish there was more talk about STEAM because it's really important to have the two. Um, my second question is um, for Rebecca, the artist. I've looked at your website and I see that you've done 2D and 3D work, but in this particular project, you've taken it beyond to immersive technology. How did you learn to do that? Well, well there was the pandemic and I was sitting around. <laughs> I was sitting around a lot and I, I started, you know, we, we got this grant, this little sort of mini seed grant through the Ocean Memory Project to work on this. And so um, I just started playing around with video and, um, and built this thing, you know. Like Michael Jordan. You just did it. <laughs> I just did it. No, um, you know, I'd been already kind of playing around with sound before this piece as well. So. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's been interesting. My work has sort of evolved to include a lot of different mediums, and I sort of, I think about, you know, I used to define myself as a painter or, you know, I'm just an artist, and so I, for, for this particular project, you know, a moving picture felt like the right tool to use for this, for this project. So I figured out how to do it, or, you know, in other cases, I will bring in experts to help me figure out how to do something, like programming LED lights to mimic bioluminescent movements, you know. For the piece in Georgia. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I want to make sure that, I mean, this is kind of in your face, but I want to make sure it's not so uh, obvious. When you walk out the door of the auditorium, it's not just the video upstairs. There's a grid of paintings that, the, uh, that was done by Rebecca that the Academy has acquired for the permanent collection. So 
um, I, I do want to make sure that people notice that uh, when they, they walk out. Thank you so much yes, for your question. It's beautiful work. Thank beautiful. you. And congratulations to all of you. It's a, a wonderful project. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to our last question and then we're going to go to community share. All right, thank you so much for this amazing panel. Um, I'm a PhD student in Eric Cordez's lab, so it's nice to see you, Rebecca. Uh, my question is actually for you. Uh, as you've become more kind of immersed in the field of marine science and you've learned a lot more kind of about ocean science in general, have you noticed what inspires you change? Have, is everything that, you know, you've learned kind of inspiring you in different ways? And I I'm, would be really, really interested in hearing that kind of perspective. I mean, it's really hard to describe. I mean, I, again, I had never thought about microbes before joining the Ocean Memory Project. I can't stress that enough. And, you know, I, <laughs> I, I mean, no, I, it's, it has absolutely changed. I mean, it's not only changed the kind of projects I want to work on, but it, it's like I, I just, it just keeps coming, and I, I, I feel like I have projects for the next 30 years. You know, I just like, I am so excited and passionate about the collaborations I'm doing, and you know, it's not, it's not just one collaboration, like I see collaborators as collaborators for life, you know? Um, you know. Some of these relationships, Eric was the first person I collaborated with, and he is one of the, you know, he is the lead scientist on this, uh, the immersion project that I keep talking about, which is, um, you know, um, about sort of helping to rehabilitate the coral reefs, the deep sea coral reefs in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, it has, it has really, uh, definitely um, forced me to kind of focus on what I want to work on because I probably have more projects than I have time for. I'm probably overcommitted at the moment anyway. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I think I'm definitely really excited about continuing to work with oceanographers. You know, I've, I've done some other collaborations, but I feel really tied to the sea in some way, and um, I just... I feel changed by the whole experience, you know, not only the Ocean Memory Project, but just having the opportunity to go out to sea for the first time. Um, it just, even before I went down, you know, in the submersible. Um, whenever I'm giving a, an artist talk, I always, I always say that my husband jokes, my husband's here, hi. Um, he, he, he always, he jokes that he never saw it coming when we got married that I'd become a sailor. And like, you know, I, <laughs> it's true. I, the two surprises of my life are being a chicken owner and, and being a sailor, I guess. <laughs> Good. I don't know. Did I answer your question? I don't know that yeah, I did. Yeah, thank okay. You. okay. So thank you uh, all for a wonderful uh, evening. Please give a round of applause for our, our distinguished. <laughs>